Thank you very much. Chairman today, but uh, nonetheless, this uh, president of uh, the Ghana National, I mean Ghana Students Union in Russia. Um, it, it's a great honor to be invited to participate in your congress. Uh, when I was told to come along, um, I thought, well, Russia is quite far. But nonetheless, given the caliber of uh, uh, Mr. Patrick and his persuasion, I couldn't do much but to sacrifice some time uh, in Kabul here. <laughs> and I must say, I am not disappointed at all. Um, for a student union you know, to be able to put together something like this is commendable. You have to be very proud of yourselves. Uh, it's a great achievement. Uh, given your financial constraints and some of the difficulties that uh, you had to face. I understand many of you traveled very far to get to Moscow and be part of this event, and um, it is a good thing, and I'll tell you why. Um, I've been given 25 minutes or half an hour to talk to you about Pan Africanism, but what I'm going to tell you now um, doesn't include my 25 minutes. Is uh, you all agree with me? Uh, that to give a lecture, sometimes there has to be some introductions. Um, what I'm telling you is just a piece of advice, and I want you to listen carefully. There is a reason why whenever people are having events or celebrations or festivals, everybody goes for what? A foul, isn't it? People will say, uh, let's buy some poultry fowls, chicken, and <coughs> um, It's not by mistake. And I'll tell you the story behind that. You know, we Africans are uh, used to using animals uh, in storytelling. Years ago in the jungle, all animals lived together. But there was one strange animal, the wolf. The wolf, the wolf was terrorizing the rest of the animals. He would come along and he would catch whatever animal he gets and eat it. So the animals weren't very happy. And they decided to have a meeting. They said, look, we need to address this uh, uh, issue of having uh, Mr. Wolf killing us as and when he pleases. But the problem in the jungle is that every time they call for a meeting, some people don't attend. And one of those that don't attend is Mr. Cork and his wife, the head. They never attend meetings. So, on this day, they sent someone to tell Mr. Cork and his wife, the hen, that there is a very important meeting going on uh, that affects everybody's security and interest. Mm -hmm. So they should uh, make an effort to come. And they responded, oh, just go. Whatever you people decide, we agree. It's fine. We just go. And that is what they've been doing for many, many years. So they all gathered in the house of uh, Mr. Wolf and said, look, Wolf, we're not very happy with the way you are treating us. You're making our life unbearable here uh, in, in our country. You know, you come along and you keep eating us. So uh, we, we want to tell you that we don't like that. If possible, can we, can you also start eating vegetables? And um, Wolf says, well, unfortunately, I'm cursed with an insatiable appetite for meat. So I can't stop. So if you wish, you can choose one of you to set my, my, my purpose, and uh, I will stop harassing you. So somebody in the crowd said, it looks like a cock and hen said that uh, if whatever we decide, we'll agree. So they said, yeah, yeah, okay, then we give you cock and hen. <laughs> and up to date, when there is anything going on, people say, check it. Out of all the animals in the world, <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing the price. It is important that you attend some of these events. It is um, very, very important because you have left your families far away in Ghana and other parts of Africa. You are living in a very strange country. It's a developed country, um, but you are not many. Um, we all rely on information in whatever we do. 
Your education is about information. People are imparting knowledge to you. They are teaching you things. They are giving you information. That is how we grow. Now, these sort of meetings and conferences and congresses are all places where we get information. So you need to attend these meetings and conferences and then network. It's not just about showing your face here. Um, if you go to any conference or any congress, try to make at least meet three people, take their numbers, people you have never spoken to before, get their numbers, say hello to them, because you don't know where you're going to end up tomorrow. You are the youth of today, you're going to become the leaders of tomorrow. Some of you will become heads of states, some of you will become ambassadors, some of you will hold very high positions. There is nothing more distressing than you walking to the president, knowing that he was once in Russia as a student at the same time as you were, but he doesn't know you. So you need to network, you need to speak to each other, and you need to attend congresses and conferences. I am here because of networking. I am here because I have a wide network of friends. It is through that network that I was connected to somebody else in Russia. And that person invited me and I couldn't say no. Because I would be disappointed, not just him, but my other colleagues in, in the UK. Um, you don't know me, and I don't know you. But today, for the first time, we have met. There are no strangers in the world. It's just people we have not met. That said, it is true I am a lawyer by profession. I am a barrister. I studied in the UK. Um, I was called to the English bar, and um, I set up my own practice. My firm is called Thompson's Legal Services. Um, I do predominantly immigration work. I represent a lot of immigrants in the UK, uh, both in the courts and outside the courtrooms. Aside of that, I am also an author. And um, this is one of my books that I published. It's called Gunja. Because I am a Gunja, and I don't want anybody to write my history for me, so I wrote it. And so it is the history of Gunja, but it's also the history, it's also the history of Northern Ghana and the whole of Ghana. If you read it, you will find a lot of useful information about our past. Um, I brought only two copies. They are not for you because you didn't network with me then. <laughs> the two copies are the people that networked with me before I came to Russia. And that is the president, uh, Mr. Patrick, and Caroline Bunya. They are having these two copies. That said, um, when I'm not researching, I am also a Pan-African. And so the bulk of my work uh, is activism. I'm an activist. And I am a member of the Pan-African Federalist Movement. It's a huge movement. We are scattered all over the world. Um, we had our first conference in Accra in December. And we had about 800 delegates from across the world who attended. Amongst them, um, we had Samia Nkuma was there, we had a, a son of uh, Marcus Gavi, we had the daughter of Malcolm X, we had the grandchildren of Bob Marley, all present at the conference. Um, Ghana's president, Akufado, was there as well. Uh, we are still working. Um, we are working very hard uh, to achieve something, and that thing, we shall achieve it. Um, and so, as a member of the Pan-African Federalist Movement, there is nothing more exciting than talking about Africa, our past, present, and future. And when you put your, when the, the, the uh, organizers decided to have this summit, they chose a topic, which is the role of the African youth in the diaspora in the total liberation of Africa. I don't know who came up with this topic, but whoever did is a genius. Not least because the month of May is a very important month for Pan-Africans. 25th May is Africa Day, and there's a reason we celebrate it. It is natural that parents will always pass their genes to their offspring, And so it is that our fathers passed on the mantle of the struggle for African unity onto us. We shall pass it over to those that will come after us. 
Now, the issue of uh, Pan-Africanism is a very broad and wide topic. Nobody has even attempted to define it. Um, but in a nutshell, it's simply um, the desire or the vision that if all Africans come together as one people, we would be in a better position to manage our affairs in terms of uh, the economic and political progress of the continent. But Pan-Africanism has always been connected um, with those in the diaspora. Now, when we talk about the role of the youth in the diaspora, I, I'm not sure whether we are referring to youth students who have left the shores of your country temporarily to acquire education and move back to Ghana. But um, as far as Pan-Africanism is concerned, the diaspora is a very big group and a part of the AU family. They form the sixth um, group in the AU hierarchy of groups. For example, we have the ECOWAS for West Africa, East Africa, North Africa, South Africa, and Central Africa. They are the five regions of uh, the African Union. The SIF region is the people of the diaspora. Now, uh, those in the diaspora are the family members of Africa who were forcibly removed from Africa uh, during the era of the slave trade uh, and shipped to the United States and the Caribbean. Um, the descendants of these people uh, are what we call the diaspora. They are the, those we call the diaspora. As we speak, the diaspora branch total about 140 million people uh, who are scattered over the United States, South America, and the Caribbean. They've always seen Africa as their home, and Africa will always treat them as a part of Africa. I am going to juggle your mind a bit. I'm going to take you down the road of history, um, just so I can get my message across properly. Um, in the first place, how did the trade itself happen? Well, a lot was going on in Europe uh, in the 15th and 16th century. In the United Kingdom, we had King uh, Henry VIII. King Henry's wife did, could not give him a head to the throne. He wanted a son. And in those days, all the kings in Europe um, looked to the Vatican for spiritual guidance. The Pope was the one that would usually, um, during this sort of, uh, when there's a new king, it was the Pope that would come and preside over the ceremonies. So he sent a message to the Pope saying, I want to divorce my wife because I need a son. And she's not giving me one. And the Pope told him, you can't. Um, by virtue of the Christian religion, you can only divorce your wife uh, when, if there is adultery. In the absence of adultery, you can't divorce your wife. And he said, look, but who are you to tell me uh, whether I can or I cannot divorce my wife? You have no control about me. I'm the king, and so I have the right to make my decisions. So the issues and confusion between the king and the pope resulted in the king deciding that he was now breaking away from the Catholic Church to establish the Anglican Church, or the Church of England. So, um, yes, the church was established by, that was around 1530s, in the 1530s. Uh, around 1604 to 1611, the next king, who was uh, in the person of King James, commissioned the translation of the Bible from Latin and Greek to English. And so we have the King James Version. Now, in England itself, or in the United Kingdom at that time, uh, not many people were happy with the decision the king had taken. And it was more like uh, the king was now going to be interfering in religious affairs, because obviously the king became the, the head of the Anglican Church. So that being the case, a lot of people decided to move away, because if you stay in the UK, there was a lot of persecution for all those that um, did not agree with the decision of the king to break away from the Catholic Church. And so there were some sort of religious problems. 
and people wanted a place they could go and worship God freely without any interference by the king. So people decided, they began migrating to the United States of America around the East Coast. Now, the, these families that moved to the US, they said, look, we don't want our descendants, our children to grow up not knowing where we come from. So those who moved from York in England settled in today's New York. Those from Boston settled in Boston. Um, almost all the names in the United States have their equivalent in the UK. So um, some of them settled in Connecticut and other parts of uh, uh, the new, new coast, uh, the East Coast. Um, those from Scotland, some moved to Canada and they settled in Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia is French for New Scotland. So they always add New. So you hear things like New England and New this. That is exactly where those people came from. They came from the old one to the new one. So having arrived in the United States and set themselves up, they were about 13 colonies. Um, they, they were there, and the king said, well, no problem. You are still my subjects. It doesn't matter which part of the world you are. So you are still under my control. So you will have to pay taxes. Every year, the Americans will have to ship taxes to the king in the, in the UK until somebody thought, why should we be paying taxes to the king when we have no representation in the English parliament? We are not represented. So we don't have to pay any taxes to them. And that also started another problem between the king and his subjects in the United States. Um, a ship had come to the US to do some tea to England by way of taxes in uh, Boston. And somebody went up the ship and then threw all the tea into the water. And that triggered the war. Uh, it's called the Boston Tea Party. They had. Um, it was a war for their independence. So after that American War of Independence, um, they oh, attained their freedom, but it was not time to build their country. They set up in, in England. There was a company called the uh, Something Virginia Company that was based in, in England. They would, were encouraging people to move to the new world because there was a lot of land. And they promised everyone, if you set your foot in the new world, in the US, you are given 50 acres of land. So a lot of people migrated to um, the United States. A population of about 4 million in the 1700s uh, went up to about uh, um, uh, 30 million in, in the matter of uh, a generation or, or in less than 30 years the population kept increasing. You come, they give you 50 acres of land. They had to farm, they were farmers, and they needed people on, on those farms. They needed people to work on the plantations, the tobacco plantations and the sugar plantations. And where were they going to get these people? That was how come they turned their attention on Africa. And it was, the history of the dream itself has sometimes been manipulated because history is said that it depends on who is telling it. If you are reading the history of the slave trade from the perspective of a European, you will see things differently. If you read it from the standpoint of a slave or a former slave, it is a different story. Unfortunately, um, Africans we're not blessed with the skill of um, reading and writing. So most of the first books we had to read were the books that were written by the uh, slave masters. But to tell you, just to give you a brief uh, description as to what happened at that time. In Ghana, for example, whole villages were depopulated. Languages have been rendered extinct because of the slave trade. Because what they did was to analyze the black man and his way of life. They did that very well. 
And so they empowered some tribes and then they pitched them against each other to fight. Because it is only during such wars do they get the slaves. Because wars, the loser become uh, the captives. So they would pick them up and they match them to Pecos and Elimina castles, where they keep them in dungeons until the ship is ready, and then they will ship them off to the new world. Um, in Salada, in, in, in the northern region, was one of the slave centers. We had the slave market in Salada. The chains are still there. People come to sell uh, people in, in that market. It was more like a survival of the fittest. Um, like I said, the strongest men, nobody wanted weaklings because a weaker person would not be able to withstand all the difficulties in, in the journey from uh, Africa to the US or the Caribbean. So what they wanted was very strong men and women. Um, and so they took away our strongest men and our strongest women. Approximately 12 million Africans were shaped from the end of the 15th century to uh, the latter part of the 18th century. 12 million people. Millions more died in transit. Millions more also died when they finally arrived in an effort to resist and run away. They, a lot of our people were killed and dumped in the seas. When, around 1807, when uh, slavery was finally abolished, something happened in, in, in Ghana. You know, when, before they had announced, the news had reached Africa that uh, the trade was no more, we don't want any more slaves, the British had sort of uh, placed some ships on the waters to prevent people from bringing in all slaves to discourage the trade. They, they were lots of people, slaves in transit from the north to the south, the coastal areas. And there were thousands and thousands more already in Pecos and Elimina area. The question was, what do we do to these people? Where do they go? Because they, the white man doesn't want them anymore. Um, but what should we do with this cargo? The chiefs at that time had realized that a danger was going to happen because these people have won their freedom. So they met and they said, look, the only way we can avoid a mixture of slaves and our own indigenous citizens is for every tribe to give their people a mark so that we can identify who is this and who is that. So that's how we came to have tribal marks in Ghana. So it was to prevent the mixture. We wanted to identify each other. So when you see somebody from your hometown or your, your, your tribe, it's easy to identify them just by looking at the face. The first ID card, of course. <laughs> yeah. So these are all the impact of the trade. This is what the trade did to us. Um, over there in the, in the Caribbean and um, the US, a lot of things happened. The first group of people who were taken there were very difficult to control. They couldn't control them. So they had to find a way. They didn't understand why the people were not, they were, some of them would rather kill themselves. And they were so volatile that they needed to find a solution to control these slaves. They sought help from a German professor. And the professor asked them, how are you treating them? And then they, they said, well, uh, well, they, they are dead. And the women, we allow them to live with their women, and the women produce children. And they said, well, that is, your, that is the reason why you can't control them. Because you know women, they, when they have a child, they talk to the child. They are able to transfer their languages to their children and they tell their children where they come from, and they tell the children why they are where they are. So the professor advised that if they have a child, 
take the child away. Don't allow them to uh, take care of their children. Because if their children grow up, they will fight you. So they started excluding the children from the parents. So those children do not have any sense of identity. They don't know where they come from. So with that, they were able to control the new breed um, of slaves. Where some things happened, we had what we call a, a slave farms. They would match a woman and a man together. You have to sleep to reproduce. It doesn't matter if it's a mother and a son, or um, a brother and a sister. It's irrelevant. You have to do it. This is what our people went through. And in some cases, when the man refuses to do it, uh, the slave masters will actually turn him over and do him himself in the presence of his children and his uh, colleagues in order to embarrass him. Um, and that is why in places like the Caribbean, if you talk about the Batiman, they get really upset. That is uh, one of the, the reasons. Naturally, people will always resist oppression. So the descendants of these slaves fought very hard for their freedom. And they, 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 they did their best under the circumstances in which they found themselves. Uh, in some cases, they were successful, like the Maroons of the Caribbean. They actually resisted to a point that they had their own land. Uh, those in Haiti, and, and so on and so forth. But slavery was finally abolished. But the blacks in the US, for example, were not considered as citizens of the United States. Even though they were given their freedom, they were not given any land. They were not given anything. So economically, how were they to start? From nothing. And so that oppression caused, uh, well, it gave birth to some um, sort of uh, leaders or, or, or Pan-Africans or heroes, if you like. People who stood against the system, the system that oppressed them, the system that denied them their rights. And so you would have heard of uh, Marcus Garvey, you would have heard of Malcolm X, you would have heard of Martin Luther King. All of these guys were civil rights activists fighting for um, a place for the black man in the world. Thank you very much, I'm really grateful. Right. So, because this resistance started in the diaspora, Pan-Africanism itself sort of started in the diaspora. And um, back in Africa itself, now that slavery was abolished, what were they to do with the people of Africa? On a Saturday, 15th November, 1884, until 26th February, 1885, the German, the then German Chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, that was his name, in his residence in Berlin, he invited a conference of representatives of 14 nations, including the United Kingdom, the United States. At that time, we didn't have Turkey. We had the, the Ottoman Empire. Um, Denmark, France, Belgium, and other countries. Their representatives converged in, in, in Berlin. And they did so to talk about Africa. Even though Africa itself was not represented, there was no African in that delegation. And they couldn't have been an African. The reason is because the Africa we know today is not the same Africa at that time. So in that meeting, the meeting lasted over 100 days. And for a meeting or a conference to have lasted more than 100 days, it tells you that a lot was discussed and a lot was planned. But at the end of the conference, we had the Berlin Act of 1885. What that act did was to partition Africa amongst the European uh, powers. So the whole of Africa was divided amongst them. 
and it was more like if any one of you find yourself in any territory and you can have an agreement with the chiefs, then you own that territory. So that is how the British came to have Ghana, Gambia, Sierra Leone, uh, and Nigeria. Then the French also had their territories. The Germans had Togo and Namibia, and um, the, the French and the Portuguese had Mozambique and some other countries. Uh, the Belgians had the Congo and some other countries too. They partitioned the continent for their own benefit. My brothers and sisters, the partitioning of the continent was not meant for our benefit. It was for their benefit. They wanted to control the people, the land, the resources, and everything. Everything was theirs. But then, um, as a result of the slave trade itself, the trade had brought about an anti-African racism. Racism was as a result of uh, slavery. Because of what happened to us, we were treated as uh, less human. We think we, we, are, not, we are not developed enough. We, 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 are, we, are, we are less human. We are not fit to be called, to be put on the same category like them. And so we have white supremacy. They've only seen themselves as superior to all other races. That said, they had to find a way to deal with the colonies they have. So they set up administrative centers, they set up training some of uh, our people to be able to speak their language and to be able to do some of the work that they wanted them to do. What they were interested in was the resources. They would um, uh, harvest our gold, our diamonds, our uh, magnets, bauxite, um, ivory, anything they could lay their hands on. Um, they carried on doing that until such a time that a few Africans, people like Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, who had the, better, the privilege of studying in the United States of America and Britain, and uh, had seen what was happening to our brothers in the diaspora, realized that no, this isn't the way it should be. It is wrong. Something has to be done about this. We need to free ourselves. We need to have our independence. In fact, um, whenever Pan-Africans meet to deliberate, strategize, and plan what to do, uh, we, we call them Pan-African Congresses. Uh, one of the major conferences or congresses happened in Manchester in 1945. Soon after that, um, Kwame Nkrumah and co had returned to Ghana uh, to wrestle power with, with, with the white man. They thought the white man had to go. We are capable of managing our own affairs. Uh, in addition to that, there were other things that took place at that time. Uh, for example, we had the Second World War. And um, at the end of the war, in which a lot of Ghanaians had participated, uh, the soldiers realized that, after all, the white man wasn't actually as brave as it was to be. Um, we went, they we were cowards. They did a lot of things that we, people are not supposed to do. So what right have they got uh, to rule us? So it triggered a series of demonstrations. When they came back, the ex men came back, and Kwame Nkrumah was smart enough to capitalize on some of these things and wrest the power from the white man. Um, just so we are clear about some of the problems that we lack face. Thank you. As early as 2007, the former president of uh, France, President Sarkozy, in his speech said that um, the African has not fully entered history and that for thousands of years, there was no idea of progress in Africa. That was President Sarkozy of France. <laughs> as early as January last year, you all heard President Trump describe the world countries as shithole countries. <laughs> yes. 
Well, this comments echoes that of many white Americans and uh, white Europeans. They, 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 they are not making them up for fun. It is a fact. That is how they see us. They still see us as being inferior. And everything they do to us is because they think less of us. When Kwame Nkrumah, uh, when Ghana became independent in 1957, the following year, in 1958, Kwame Nkrumah called a conference of the independent African states. And they were to discuss the progress the Pan-Africans had made so far, the African liberation fighters. And it was in that meeting that they proposed that we should set this day aside and call it African Liberation Day. That's the 25th of May. And so it was, this 25th of May was being celebrated. Now, the group, the vision of this group was to make sure that all other African countries attained their independence. And by 1960s, 1960s, about 32 African countries had attained their independence, some sort of independence, if you like. But they, all these independent countries were talking about one thing, a united Africa. The problem they had was they couldn't agree on the sort of unification that the continent should have. So it brought a division amongst them. Kwame Nkrumah and his friends, uh, Guinea, Mali, Algeria, Libya, and Egypt, and then Cameroon. They wanted uh, a federal African, um, federal African state where all the independent countries will give up part of their sovereignty for the one united Africa. One country, one currency, one military force, and so on and so forth. But there was another group, who, which was led by the former president of Senegal, um, <coughs> President Senghor of Senegal. The Kwame Nkrumah's group met in Casablanca to, uh, that's where they had their first meeting. And so they were called the Casablanca Bloc. The rest of the leaders met in Monrovia. They didn't want a federal African um, state they said, well, it should be a gradual process and that uh, we should be looking for an economic unity, not a political unity. We call them the Moruvia bloc. They were led by President Senghor of um, uh, Senegal. Now, the interesting thing is, because they couldn't agree as to the sort of liberation the continent wanted, uh, Emperor Hill Selassie of Ethiopia decided to invite all of them to a conference in Addis Ababa in 1963 in order to discuss the way forward <coughs> so that they can resolve their differences. It was a very interesting conference because the Casablanca bloc, led by Kwame Nkrumah, wanted the um, leaders who had gathered in Addis Ababa to actually sign a unification agreement there to form a federal African uh, state. But he was opposed strongly by President Nyerere of Tanzania, uh, former president of Tanzania. Uh, Nyerere said, no, it shouldn't, that shouldn't be the case. It has to be like the uh, Moravia bloc have always advocated, a gradual process. And Kwame Nkrumah was so angry that he actually walked out of the conference and was only persuaded to come back by uh, the president of Guinea, Sekuturi. Eventually, at the end of the day, um, Nyerere and his group had a day. And so they couldn't establish a federal African state. So what they could do was come up with the Organization of African Unity, which was established in, uh, uh, in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, to oversee the uh, unification process. So we had the OAU, and the OAU was also committed to liberating the rest of the African countries that were still under colonial rule, such as Angola, Southern Rhodesia, which is today is Zimbabwe, uh, South Africa, which had the apartheid system and some other countries. By 1994, all of the African countries had attained uh, their independence. So uh, the OAU, to some extent, has been very helpful uh, in terms of uh, the work they 
they, they, they did in the great um, the African continent. They sometimes had the support of um, countries like Cuba and some of the socialist countries have um, occasionally placed resources at their disposal to help them achieve uh, their, their struggle for uh, self 